Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Almost four years ago to the day, on April 15th, 2013, two homemade bombs detonated 12 seconds and 210 yards apart near the finish line of the annual Boston Marathon. Three people were killed. Several hundred others were injured, including 16 who lost limbs. Beyond these facts, the story of the Sanayev brothers and the complex web of events that led to that day are very much an open question. The more or less official narrative long touted by authorities of the lone wolf Muslim extremist has long since been discredited. The story that is emerging of what really might have happened in Boston has some eerie parallels to today's headlines. Russia, the FBI, FBI informants, counterterrorism agents not informing the FBI, etc. And now a new book by longtime Boston-based investigative journalist Michelle McPhee brings new light to the story and reinforces what many have been trying to point out for many years. Michelle McVie has been nominated for three Emmy Awards for investigative journalism and works as a Boston-based producer for Brian Ross's investigative unit at ABC News. She's the host of a daily radio talk show and wrote an award-winning column for the Boston Herald. She's the author of numerous books and articles, and it is my pleasure to welcome Michelle McPhee here to talk about her latest work, Maximum Harm, The Sanayev Brothers, The FBI, and The Road to the Marathon Bombing. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. What an introduction. Thank you so much for having me. As you began to try and uncover the layers and layers and layers of this story, to what extent did you work back from the official narrative and try and uncover, or was that something that essentially went out the window pretty early on as you began to find out more and more about what had transpired vis-a-vis the Sanaya brothers? As early as April 18th, 2013, and many will remember that is the day that the FBI released the photos of suspect white hat and suspect black hat. It it seemed odd. The press conference um, was abrupt. Local law enforcement had complained that the FBI released these images to television reporters and to the public before they consulted with anyone in any of the surrounding towns. Um, But as early as Tuesday, There was, you might recall, that the FBI overtook a hangar at the Black Falcon terminal, a cruise terminal here in Boston. And there they were going through reams and reams of evidence, most importantly, photos and videos taken from the scene. And it was on Tuesday, I got a phone call from multiple sources talking about an altercation that took place in this evidence hangar. And what had happened was there were a number of FBI agents that were sitting at one of these terminals off in a corner, and they appeared to be comparing photos of suspect black hat and suspect white hat to photos, including a mugshot, of people who looked like the older brother Tamerlan Zanayev. There was a verbal altercation at the terminal. There, was, there were accusations hurled. You knew, once again, the FBI knew, and you didn't share it with us. And from that point forward, there were just nonstop murmurings about whether or not the FBI knew exactly who the marathon bombers were. And once again, they weren't sharing. You may recall that Boston has a long and sordid history of infuriating local law enforcement with cases like Whitey Bulger and Mark Rossetti, who were FBI sponsored informants who were essentially given a free pass to continue to commit crimes as, as grotesque as murder in Whitey Bulger's case. What is it about Boston and the arrangements that exist there between the police, the FBI, other law enforcement that seems to constantly lead back to these cases happening? I mean, I don't know what it is about Boston, but I know that it keeps happening. And this particular case was egregious. And especially when Sean Collier was assassinated in cold blood. Of course, in maximum harm, I'm not blaming federal officials in any way for what took place on April 15th, 2013. Informants have always been a necessary evil in order to combat everything from biker gangs and organized crime, and most recently after 9-11, terrorism. There, it's, it's necessary to make these unholy alliances with confidential informants in order to take down these terror cells. And so nobody is blaming the government for what took place on April 15th. But certainly, if they knew who the Zania brothers were, and, it's, and it really, I think, raises an eyebrow, and it stretches, it's, I'm incredulous, and I know a lot of other people are, that the FBI talks about an open case 
against Tamron Zanayev in March of 2011. In fact, just this week, the FBI, very strangely, released a single proffer report about one of the visits they had made to Tamron Zanayev's home in 2011 and talking about how he was desperate to become a citizen. But what the FBI didn't tell us at the time was why they didn't recognize Tamlin Zanayev. Now, you and I, you know, we've been in this profession for a while. If you interviewed somebody face-to-face multiple times and then their picture emerged as a suspect in the marathon bombings, don't you think that you would remember what they look like? Talk a little bit about the fact, though, that the FBI seemed to lose control of their informant in this case particularly when one looks at the trips back and forth that Tamerlans and I have took between Russia and the U.S. and moving back and forth with complete impunity. Well, and some would point to a different agency altogether for that sort of travel. Because remember, you know, the, uh, the FBI cannot operate overseas and the CIA cannot operate domestically. But when you look into Tamerlans and I's history from his arrival, In the United States in 2002, he had a connection to the CIA via his uncle. Uh, We all remember maybe perhaps the uncle that came out and declared his nephews were losers. Uh, He was sort of a a national celebrity for a little bit just because he was outspoken about what his nephews had done. Well, Ruslan Sarni in 2002 was married to Samantha Ankara Fuller, who was the daughter of a CIA official named Graham Fuller. And in 2002, Graham Fuller was the CIA station chief in Ankara, Turkey, which is exactly where the Holds and Ives family originated their political asylum case from. So the whole family from Russia gets into the country via Ankara, Turkey, where Ruslan's father-in-law was the station chief. So obviously, the FBI was not the ag- only agency that had interaction with Tamlin and Ives. But how they lost control, and that's what, of course, what you're referring to, is this travel. Tamlin Zanayev had raised alarm bells in Russia with counterterrorism officials. They sent a warning to the FBI legal attache in Russia saying, we have intercepted text messages between a Canadian jihadi and Tamlin Zanayev. We're concerned. This is the information we've been able to gather. That, of course, is what sparked the FBI's original visits to the Zanayev household in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, apparently they opened the case and they claim they shut the case in June. But that didn't stop any interaction between the FSB and and American counterterrorism officials. In September of 2011, the FSB sent a second letter, this time to the CIA, saying we've intercepted more alarming text messages and emails between Tamil and I of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and well-known jihadi and jihadi sympathizers here in Russia. We believe he's going to travel to Russia and join the jihad. Well, inexplicably, that was ignored, and in January of 2012, that's exactly what Tamlin Zanayev did. The only action that U.S. counterterrorism officials took was adding him to two separate terror watch lists. So Tamlin Zanayev, when he left the country in January of 2012, was on two terror watch lists. He did not have an American passport. He traveled with a passport that had been issued in Kyrgyzstan, and yet while he was in Russia, he reported that passport stolen. He spends more than six months in a terrorist hotbed in Dagestan and returns while on two separate watch lists, this time without his Kurds passport, and breezes through customs with no problems whatsoever. A lot of people in law enforcement would point to people had to have pulled the strings to allow Tamlin to get in and out of the country with such ease while he's on all of these terror watch lists. To what extent was the Department of Homeland Security involved, and what was their interaction with the FBI in this case? Well, the Department of Homeland Security had a completely separate case going on that targeted a group of Eritrean drug dealers who were running drugs up and down the East Coast and mailing and sending some of the money back to Al-Shabaab. And that was a very important case for the Department of Homeland Security. One of the targets in that case just happened to be a close friend of Tamlin Zanayev's. And that case was taken down with the help of a confidential informant that many people believe was Tamlin Zanayev. Talk a little bit about the FBI's persistent denials of their involvement with Zanayev. I think there's a term for it. It's called Fed speak. And despite their carefully worded denials, 
there, if, there is really no conclusive evidence that they didn't use him as an informant. In fact, there's this persistent evidence that they did. Because upon Tamalin's return to the United States, he immediately was a candidate for citizenship. Now, we all know that USCIS has a policy that you can't even apply to become a naturalized American citizen if you've been arrested. It's called the Good Moral Character Clause. And Tamalin and I have had been arrested in 2009 for a domestic violence charge. So it was completely inexplicable and remains inexplicable to this day how somebody with that kind of a violent arrest record who is unemployed, who just returned from a trip overseas where he had been spotted interacting with terrorists, somebody who was on these terror watch lists was suddenly a candidate for citizenship. And not only was his naturalization application reopened, but it was fast-tracked, according to the Inspector General's report, by his FBI handler, somebody who was assigned to the counterterrorism unit of the Boston FBI office. So there was this back and forth. When he gets back, all of a sudden, he's going to be a citizen. There's back and forth between um, the Department of Homeland Security who said, hold on a minute, this guy is not eligible for citizenship. They would reach out to the FBI. The FBI would urge the Department of Homeland Security, no, no, we found nothing wrong with this uh, guy. Please give him a citizenship. This went back and forth until January 23rd, 2012, when Tamalins and I have went to the federal building for what he believed would be his last visit before becoming a full-fledged American citizen. There was another bureaucratic snafu. Something went wrong, and Tamalins and I have snapped. He, he ripped up his application he petitioned for a name change. He wanted to change his name to Muaz in honor of a slain Chechen rebel. He left there angry, and weeks later, he was buying the biggest and loudest pyrotechnics at a phantom fireworks in Seabrook, New Hampshire. What else was going on with Sanaev that led to him snapping that day? I, I mean, I think that he, was, he had become increasingly radicalized. And back in Russia, every person that he met with that are uh, that been reported by the Russian Interior Ministry was tracked and killed. So there were eight high-level Islamic militants who were being sought. They would be spotted with Tamlins and I have, and short time afterwards they would be tracked and, and, and at least eight cases killed. The last raid by the Russian Interior Ministry came in July of 2012. Everyone, including some of the people that Tamlin had been in contact with, that initiated the, the initial warning to the FBI and the CIA. There was a raid, and everyone in this terrorist training camp was slain, and Tamlins and I have hightailed it out of the region the very next day with a one-way ticket paid for in cash from Moscow to Boston, where, again, he breezes through customs, not a problem. How was the ticket paid for? Where did the money come from? What do we know about that? We know absolutely nothing about that, but considering that the FBI report that was released just this week talks about how Tamlins and I have told agents he was too, joke, too broke, too, too unemployed to go to the Hajj, uh, it, it really, I think, raises a lot of questions about how he was able to leave the country, travel to Russia, stay there without a job, without any money, and then suddenly pay you know, 2,050 euro cash for a one-way ticket back to Boston. Talk a little bit about Janet, Nap Janet Napolitano's testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Well, she was asked about some of this, and the answers were less than forthcoming. They were less than forthcoming, and in one case was an outright lie. One of the explanations she had for Tamalin's travel in and out of the country was that his name was misspelled on the travel documents. Well, when I, uh, in the book, you will see that I obtained the travel documents, and his name was spelled exactly how everyone knew his name to be spelled. So that fall, fell flat on its face. And a short time after her testimony, Janet Napolitano resigned. And she wasn't the only high-ranking Department of Homeland Security official, a DOJ official, to resign. You'll recall that the FBI director, Bob Mueller, who ironically had been the U.S. attorney in Boston when Whitey Bulger was running amok, well, the FBI director quit in April. The head of the Boston FBI quit in April. Even the Middlesex County District Attorney, who had had a hand in this very strange, unsolved triple homicide that took place in Massachusetts on the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, he quit too. 
So the bodies were falling. These officials clearly were not being forthcoming. And we've heard Michael McCall, the chairman of Homeland Security Committee in the House, has said over and over again that it was enraging that the FBI steadfastly refused to cooperate with Congress in either public hearings or in classified settings with Congress. And that McCall at one point was apoplectic and exploded during a hearing saying that, you know, this information does not belong to the FBI. This information belongs to the American people. You might recall that a bipartisan delegation of congressional lawmakers traveled to Russia for answers with Steven Seagal, the nice. action hero. You honestly can't make this stuff up. You have the, the, uh, the action hero, Steven Seagal, from Hard to Kill, leading Congress into Russia. And when a Massachusetts lawmaker named Bill Keating, a former prosecutor, returned, he told reporters that the FSB was more, more forthcoming than the FBI. What is your sense of why the FBI has been so blatant and in trying to cover this up in the face of, as you've laid it out here and as we've talked about, pretty obvious evidence? Well, I think they can because, you know, if you look at the very carefully worded denials, it doesn't say, hey, we never had any contact with Tamalin or we weren't running Tamalin. It says we didn't recruit Tamalin. And I think that that's exactly what, uh, you know, many in the federal government have been become masterful at is this mincing of words, the, the, the very careful selection of vocabulary. Okay, so they didn't recruit him. It's, it's pretty evident that Tamlin had contacts with the CIA long before he got involved with the FBI. But they certainly had a role to play in helping Tamlin and I get his citizenship. So... I, I think that the denials are, hey, we didn't give him a top echelon informant number. A different agency did. But that doesn't absolve the FBI from uh, any sort of accountability and what happened and why they didn't share the information that they did know about Tamlin Zanayev with local law enforcement. You know, Ed Davis, the former Boston police commissioner, testified in front of Congress that the FBI didn't share information with his own officers on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Talk a little bit about the citizens of Boston and your sense of the reaction to this story as it continues to unfold. Well, I think initially there was a, there were people with somewhat uh, incredulous, you know, they wanted to see the evidence. And I think that, you know, you've read the book and you've seen that this is, this is not a theory. This is in a tinfoil hat <laughs> conspiracy spin out. This is a roadmap of all of the evidence. There's the, everything in that book is annotated. There's police reports, there's trial testimony, there's um, Homeland Security reports, there's the Inspector General's report that was commissioned by James Clapper. So there is evidence that shows that something went terribly wrong with Tamlin Zanayev. He had been made a promise, and when that promise didn't come through, he snapped. And the, and the denials are going to remain consistent because they remained consistent for 30 years about Whitey Bulger, too. Why did more of this come out? Why didn't Judy Clark bring more of this out at the trial, at the brother's trial? Because the federal judge, George O'Toole, immediately issued an order in the case that no mention of Tamlin's and I have whatsoever should be made during this trial. And any time Tamlin's name came up, it, it prompted an immediate outrage from federal prosecutors. And they kept a tight lid on anything about Tamlin. And it, it, to this day, there are more than 1,100 documents in the Zanayev case that are sealed, which is absolutely unusual. The case has been adjudicated. Joe Carr Zanayev has been sentenced to death. And every week, and you can follow the case through the appeals process, every week his new defense team in his appeal is demanding that these files that they want access to be unsealed, and every week a federal judge says you're not getting the files. What, if anything, do we think that Joe Karsanayev knows about all of this? I'm not sure how much he knows. And, you know, people want to portray him as this hapless little brother who followed Tamlin down Boylston Street. That's definitely not the case. You know, as his Twitter account, his social media shows that he had these jihadi viewpoints and he was following radical Islam for years before those bombs were detonated on Patriot's Day four years ago. Uh, do I think that he knew that his older brother was cooperating with the federal government? Probably not. Do I think that Ibrahim Todashev, the man who was slain in Orlando, Florida, in May of 2013, as he was being grilled 
about the unsolved Massachusetts triple homicide on the 10 year anniversary of 9-11 knew about Tamlin's cooperation? Absolutely. And you, and you might recall that early on in the case, his defense team filed paperwork talking about how the FBI tried to make Tamlin's and I have an informant. So I'm not the only one talking about this. This has been swirling through law enforcement circles in Massachusetts since the bombs went off. The defense team has hinted at this over and over again. It's just that I think this is finally the maximum harm, which, which took uh, a ton of work and, and ceaseless reporting, provides the evidence that I think Judy Clark failed to produce when she was defending Joe Carr's and I. It's interesting that, that so much of this are little bits and pieces that came out initially and certainly during the trial. Certainly it was, as you say, swirling around that it was always met with the argument that this was somehow conspiracy theory and not true and, and, and just total nonsense. And now we're finding out a very different story. Exactly. I mean, listen, we, it, it's long been a tactic that if you can't kill the message, kill the messenger. So it's easy to portray people who believe this as conspiracy theorists or, you know, they're going down a rabbit hole of, of nuttiness. But there is a paper trail and facts are very stubborn things, which is why you have not seen since the book was released on April 4th, you have not seen a denial from anyone in the federal government. The FBI has not come out and and denied the facts of the book. They've only said they haven't tried to recruit Tamlin Zanayev. It's going to be a tough it's going to be tough for anyone in the federal government to deny these facts because these are facts. And another fact that should have everyone in the country startled is the federal government has said on the record during Joe Carr's and I's trial and since after his trial that the Zanaya brothers did not build those bombs. Well, the immediate response to that should be from everyone in the nation, then who did? And why aren't you looking for them? And that's another one of the mysteries that is tackled in the book about this very bizarre robbery that took place 10 minutes before the MIT police officer, Sean Collier, was executed. And during that 7-Eleven robbery, there was a former MIT employee who has been identified as that robber, still not arrested, but in June of 2013 was arrested for a different crime altogether when he threatened his mother and said, I've done something that I'm going to have to answer to God for. His mother told police that her son had been friends with Tamil and I have. Police execute a search warrant in his home and find every single component of the bombs that were detonated at the Boston Marathon including ball bearings that was signature to the bombs that detonated at the finish line. But strangely and inexplicably, that man, Daniel Morley, was not uh, prosecuted for the bomb-making materials he had in his home or the threats he made against his mother or never even questioned in connection with the 7-Eleven robbery, which his own family members have identified him as a suspect. Instead, he was put in a mental institution in Massachusetts for two years, Many people believe he was cooperating with the federal government in a different case regarding anarchists and anonymous, and now he's free, driving a bus full of senior citizens when there are a lot of people in Massachusetts who truly believe that he is the true bomb builder. Is there still a Rosetta Stone for this out there? Is there something that that we still need to see, to find, to understand that would help put all of this in an even clearer perspective? Well, I think that this is a matter for Congress. And and I cannot wrap my head around the fact that this isn't the only time, but certainly the FBI's uh, steadfast refusal to cooperate with congressional investigations is something that the whole country should be up in arms over. At this point, I truly believe that there should be a a congressional investigation into the use of confidential informants. Stephen Lynch, who is a Democrat from Massachusetts, has filed ceaseless legislation about FBI accountability. We've had horrendous cases here in Boston But these cases have existed all over the country, of course. But here in Boston, Stephen Lynch is especially upset about four men who are erroneously imprisoned, who died in prison to protect Whitey Balder. Uh, We know that as early as two years ago, there was another mob captain who was suspected of being involved in the shooting death of a Massachusetts state trooper who had been given a pass because he was cooperating with the FBI against the mob. I I think that the real thing that needs to happen is that the Homeland Security officials who had any interaction with Tamlin whatsoever, whether it be the CIA, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security Drug Agency, that's what 
everybody should have to answer questions about exactly what happened and not hum it a hum it a like Janet Napolitano did in front of Congress with this nonsense that the reason they let a guy who was on two terror watch lists leave the country, spend six months getting radicalized and come back in with ease. I think there needs to be real questions about that. Will this, in your view, be grounds for more lawsuits to be brought by victims' families against the government? I mean, the the lawsuits that have been brought against the FBI for the Whitey Bulger murders Mm -hmm. and families who were completely innocent have gone nowhere. (laughs) So, and and I think that's part of the issue is that, you know, the government has escaped any culpability whatsoever when these, when these rogue informants go bad. Again, I think that the informant program is an absolute necessary evil. We need these unholy alliances to take down a multitude of criminals. But when it, goes terribly wrong, which Tamlin's and I, if it's not the first, and I'm sure he won't be the last, there should be some sort of accountability. And there should be measures put in place by Congress that, that prevent somebody like Tamlin's and I from going bad. Um, you know, let's, let's be abundantly clear. In the end, Joe Carson and I was not found by law enforcement. And a lot of people believe that's because the FBI, and I know this to be true, the FBI told, when Joe Carr escaped, that wild bomb and bullet battle in Watertown. He was bleeding and he abandoned that stolen Mercedes and he staggered up a street, leaving bloody handprints and a blood trail behind. So at the time I was in Watertown, like so many other reporters and I was getting text messages from sources saying, we're going to get them. We have a blood trail. And then those same sources were told to back off. It was an FBI scene. And so the Boston Police Homicide Squad, the state police that had dogs, they were told to back off. And we all know that in the end, who found Joe Carr? A civilian who was going out for a cigarette and saw his boat being, um, you know, the top on his boat had been, uh, was a strew and he went to investigate. And so a civilian, despite the National Guard doing door to door searches and cops in riot gear, you know, without a warrant going into people's homes. In the end, it was a civilian who found Joe Karzaniyev. And when that boat was surrounded, there was a sniper from the Nemlex SWAT team who was on the second floor of that civilian's home. And he heard Sam, uh, Joe Kar say over and again, the FBI is going to kill me. The FBI is going to kill me. Now, of course, I don't think that's the case whatsoever. But it is incredibly strange that Joe Carr's and I was bleeding profusely. He leaves these bloody handprints up and down the street where he jumped out of that vehicle. And yet they didn't find him for nearly an entire day. I think it, it raises yet another whole new uh, spectrum of questions. Then of course, there's the question of what they were doing in Watertown in the first place. And there is a police report that's re- referenced in maximum harm about Joe Carr's and I have emerging from 89 Dexter Avenue, which is right around where the shootout took place. And there was a story in Saudi Arabia about a student who lived in that house who had been pulled out of that place by the FBI and arrested. But you never heard another word about that guy again. You never heard about 89 Dexter Ave again. Nobody knows where the bombs were built. So at the very least, I think there should be some concerns about who else worked with those brothers, who built the bombs, and why are we not all that concerned about finding those people? There have also been reports that even prior to the bombing, that there were an inordinate number of federal officials, counterterrorism officials, FBI officials in the Boston area. What do we know about that? You know, I'm not sure. I, I don't know anything about that. I don't dive into that maximum harm. I think that, you know, that's, that's where people can dismiss um, this sort of journalism as conspiracy theories, you know, oh, we saw all of these people with Punisher backpacks on near the finish line. I mean, it's not unusual to have a, a especially after 9-11, to have a heavy presence of law enforcement and federal officials in an area for a major event, an, an international event like the Boston Marathon, the iconic Boston Marathon. However, if you look to Cambridge on the night of April 18th, 2013, and that's how the book opens, When you look to Cambridge and you see that the Cambridge Police Department responded to multiple 911 calls placed by concerned residents, the whole state's on edge, the city's on edge, and people were calling 911 and reporting suspicious vehicles outside of their homes in Cambridge, Mass. Right around the neighborhood where the Zanias lived, right around MIT, right around the areas where two of the co-defendants lived. And and there were surveillance teams, we come to learn, from the FBI, 
in Cambridge before the photos were released, after the photos were released, those FBI agents were, <laughs> let's just say, very uncooperative with Cambridge police officers to the point where there was an altercation between the Cambridge police commissioner and uh, a high-ranking official in the Boston FBI office, and all of that took place before Sean Collier was killed. So if the FBI knew who these brothers were, they should have shared that information, and Sean Collier might be alive today. Michelle McPhee, the book is Maximum Harm, The Sanayev Brothers, The FBI, and The Road to the Marathon Bombing. Michelle, I thank you so much for spending time with us today here on Radio Who, What, Why. I thank you so much for having me, really. I enjoy the show so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.